Hello, a teenage thief who carried out hundreds of burglaries is in prison tonight after he refused to turn his back on a life of crime. Bradley Wernham lives in Essex. He's just 19 years old. Last October, he was controversially spared a prison sentence. The judge opted instead for a community order, hoping to make Wernham an honest man. In court, today, that same judge sent him to prison for five years. Let's get the details now from Alex Dunlop in Chelmsford. You know, Stuart, if Bradley Wernham hadn't re-offended, he'd probably still be living in this quiet suburban street in Chelmsford in a flat provided rent-free in an attempt to get him back on the straight and narrow. But he just couldn't keep out of trouble. After all, this was a, a teenager, a 19-year-old, who admitted more than 650 offences over a seven-year period. We're talking about burglaries, breaking, stealing top-of-the-range cars, and all that totted up to more than a million pounds. One officer described him as a proper little Fagan. A man from whom no shed, office or house was safe. A man, the judge added, who got a rush, a buzz from committing crime. In Sawbridgeworth, Gillian Molyneux was among his hundreds of victims. He broke into her home, took her car keys and stole her car. That he escaped jail initially sickened her. And he's supposed to be a good boy, but he's not a good boy. He's a very, very bad boy. Um, who just can't stop himself, he can't help himself. He has to take other people's things. Last October, subject to a curfew and doing unpaid work, Wernham was allowed to live in a flat here, rent-free, the hope that, with help, he would reform. Not everyone was convinced. Obviously a serial offender, um, you obviously should be taken out of community, so it make it a much safer place for everyone else. No, no, I do believe that everybody deserves to be given a, a second chance, but, I mean, the uh, prison system just doesn't work at all. Re-offending happens all the time, doesn't it? It's, you know, it, it proves it doesn't work. They shouldn't deserve a second chance. Why not? Well, he's committed it too many times, hasn't he? But just two months into the rehabilitation scheme, Wernham was arrested in Whitham, trying to break into a property. Police say that after he moved to Chelmsford, the number of burglaries locally went up fourfold. Do you believe he was ever seriously going to turn over a new leaf? I do. Um, he engaged with the police from May to October, uh, when he was sentenced in October. I'm satisfied that he had every intention throughout that period to do the right thing and turn over a new leaf. Sentencing Wernham to five years, Judge Christopher Ball spoke of his immaturity to adjust to a law-abiding lifestyle. But he was at pains to praise the police. Unlike other offenders, this one-man crime wave will have only one option, to reform behind bars. You know, as uh, Wernham was being sentenced, I saw him give a rather wry smile to the judge, and as he was led down to the cells, he just ambled off with his hands in his pockets. But for the local MP, Simon Burns, it was very much a case of, I told you so. He doesn't believe that Wernham should ever have been given a second chance. When you have 645 offences and you're 18, 19 years old, I just think it is rather lenient and rather naive to have given the sentence that the judge at that time gave, and sadly it has been proved right. Now I should point out that the judge said that with Chelmsford Prison, and I quote, bursting at the gunnels, other ways to rehabilitate offenders within the community must not be abandoned. It didn't work for Wernham, he said, but it can and it does work for others. Back to you in the studio. Alex, thank you very much. Well, late this afternoon, I spoke to Chief Inspector Nick Morris from Essex Police, the man who ran the original scheme involving Bradley Wernham. And I started by asking if he now accepts the original sentence was an experiment which failed. No, because the alternative, there's, there's two outcomes from this experiment. One was that Bradley would stop offending, which would be the best outcome. The second outcome would be that he'd receive a substantial custodial sentence, which otherwise he would not have received. If he had not told us about these other offences he'd committed, he wouldn't have received this length of sentence. So both ways, the people of Essex are now safer that th these further offences won't take place because he's now in prison. What do you say to those people who point out that he is getting a lot of help, whereas those people who were the victims of his crime appear to go without any help and support at all? No, I, I can very much appreciate uh, how the victims would feel about this. However, my job was to reduce crime in Harlow and one of the ways that we can do that is targeting those offenders that commit most of those crimes. And they need that help to change their ways. If this had succeeded and Bradley had taken the help on board and had stopped offending, 
there'd be so many less victims of crime in the future. But isn't it true that the best way of stopping somebody committing crime is to lock them up? Yes, whilst they're inside, they can't commit any crimes against the public. However, short-term sentences hadn't worked for Bradley in the past, and there's nothing for us to believe that they would work uh, this time. So that's why I wanted to try something different, and this is what this scheme provided. It provided opportunities for him to either change his ways or face a, uh, a large sentence. So this could happen again with somebody else who is perhaps making life a misery for lots of other people? Yes, this would be something we would explore again in Essex. We'd look at the individual and we'd learn some lessons from dealing with Bradley. We'd look at the age of the person involved and the support network that they had around him. But it's something we definitely would consider. And obviously, as Judge Ball said, he would welcome no other people being put in this scheme should the right person be identified. Do you feel personally that Bradley Wernham let you down? I do to an extent. We know we did a lot to help him. We worked closely with him and he's decided not to take that on board. So yes, there is something personal about that. But in the end, it was my job to do that for the people of Harlow. Chief Inspector, thank you very much. Thank you. It's now estimated that 1,400 people have died and 3 million have been affected by the floods in Pakistan. Here, there's to be a national appeal for donations to help the victims. And in Luton today, local Muslim groups launched a united appeal to provide help for relatives caught up in the crisis. Let's get the details now from our Luton reporter, Nikki Jenkins. Nikki. Thanks, Susie. Well, yesterday we spoke to a young woman from Luton who'd managed to escape with her five-month-old baby girl from the floods in the northwest region of Pakistan. There are many other families here who come from that region and many, many more who come from the Punjab, which is the agricultural heartland of Pakistan, now also under threat as the rains continue to fall. The pressing need now, of course, is for the millions of dispossessed people, and it's that need that people here want to address. I'm joined by Mohammed Nadim, a local businessman. You set a target of a quarter of a million pounds, Nadim. How, how optimistic are you of reaching that? Uh, I think we could reach that very easily because we've got a really big uh, community, Luton and uh, we've, for the first time we've united all the businesses, all the mosques together and plus you've got to remember it's, it's the month of Ramadan as well so uh, I think the target would be very easy to raise. What sort of events have you got planned then? Uh, we've got, we're trying to do a iftari dinner, we're, try, we're trying to call the cricket team down, we're trying to call a very high uh, you know, uh, the delegates down to, to come and I think even on the, just that night we could raise £100,000. Easily done you think. Yeah. The money that you want to raise, you say that you're going to distribute yourselves. Do you have either the expertise and why would you want to do that anyway? The uh, thing is we want, we, want to, we want to let the people know that, uh, that the donations they give, we want to give 100% of the donations to the people that need it the most. Uh, we're working with the recognised NGOs, we're working with, the, we, you know, we've got a team of, you know, a couple of doctors, we've got a couple of professionals and we want to, we want to, the main thing is we want to make sure that this 100% uh, of the money that people give will go to the people that need it the most. And briefly, how, how strongly are people feeling in Luton? How, how deeply does this touch people? The uh, thing is, a lot of people are uh, from that region that this is happening in. And, I, and as I said, you know, whenever a disaster occurs in Luton, whether it's in Pakistan or it's in Haiti, you know, our local community gets together and they, you know, unite and they, you know, Yes. Nadim, thank you very much. If you would like to donate, there are two uh, addresses you need. It's justgiving.com forward slash Pakistan floods Luton, or you can call a telephone number. It's 0800 520 0000. Back to you. Nikki, thank you very much. And the first appeal by the Disasters Emergency Committee will be broadcast straight after Look East tomorrow night. Coming up later, how to find your perfect mate using just your nose. And 20 years after the taps almost ran dry in the summer drought,